All right. Today is Thursday, July 1st. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. We are starting a whole new month, July, and a whole new half of the year. And the big question around the investment community is, what will the second half of the year look like? And of course, if you listen to the propagandists over at CNBC, the stock pumpers, the question goes, the first half of the year was extraordinary for stocks. What are your expectations for the second half of the year? Well, my expectations are, that we're going to have another extraordinary performance for stocks in the second half of the year. And the half after that, and the half after that, and the one after that, and the one after it, and the one after it, and to infinity and beyond. And the reason is that these uh, lazy so-called money managers, who you people pay thousands if not millions of dollars to manage your money, their genius idea and premise behind their expectations that the second half of the year will be also extraordinary for stocks performances is the fact that the Fed remains accommodative, meaning that instead of looking at balance sheets, income statements, earnings forecasts, technicals, valuations, the macroeconomic environment forecast, and coming up with investment ideas that will outperform in the second half of the year based on the facts, not the wishes. The Fed has enabled this lazy investing environment where these geniuses at CNBC and the likes go on and say, bet all over the place. Place your chips all over the roulette table because the Fed will remain accommodative. Even if the ball lands at uh, zero or double zero, the Fed will cancel that and pay everybody money. Regardless of whether the ball landed in your number or not. This is the kind of casino I want to be in. And this is exactly what these uh, investment managers are expecting, that the Fed will remain accommodative, quote-unquote accommodative, which is another fancy word for market manipulation. And so long as the Fed has our backs to the moon, baby. But the problem is that we've been receiving multiple macroeconomics data, whether it is from the housing market, the Chicago PMI, or today, the ISM manufacturing survey. We have more and more indicators that inflation is growing too large and too fast to the point where it is actually causing the phenomena of stagflation. And therefore, the expectations are that the Fed will remove the quote-unquote accommodation sooner than expectations. Not because the Fed wants to do so, but the Fed's hand will be forced to do so via rising inflation. And of course, we have the big number coming out tomorrow. The jobs report, this is for the public and the private sector in the country. The Fed says, pay no attention to the CPI, PPI, core PCE, or even the Chicago PMI, the ISM manufacturing survey, that doesn't matter. Because inflation is transitory. And if it's not transitory, we got the tools, bro. What you gotta be watching for is the pace of jobs creation. We're not gonna taper, we're not gonna ease the cocaine operation until we get solid jobs reports. And that makes the number coming out tomorrow extremely important for the forecast of tapering. Now, we're going to talk about all of these macroeconomic news and more during the headlines of the day video. But in this video, we want to stick to the markets, mechanics, and technicals. And so far this week, we've been building on the theme from last week, boring market. And boring markets are actually good because the volume is down and the path of least resistance during lower volumes is higher not lower. We see these gaps overnight pushing higher and higher every day and the 10-year treasury yield is not moving anywhere, just stagnating within range. This is a perfect environment for the stock market to continue to climb higher. But when we start to read the tea leaves from a technical perspective, we see an overextended market that is running out of gas and looking desperately for a catalyst to move higher. Now, the catalyst could come out as soon as tomorrow via the non-farm payroll report. But be careful here, because while the report could give the green light for the market to blast higher, it could also be a reason to bring back the volume into the market. And if the volume comes back, it will come back to the downside. Everybody's not trading heavily right now. We're amidst the summer. The expectations are for smooth sailing. But if something changes regarding the forecast for the macroeconomics environment, which will impact the monetary policy, then the volume will have to come back to the market. And in this case, it will come back to the downside. While we don't have any technical reversal signals for the NASDAQ, the US dollar, 
and many other charts, we are starting to get hints regarding an upcoming reversal in these charts. And we will look at them in details during the charts analysis. The last thing to mention before moving on is the bearish bets against Tesla, the souffle, making millions and millions of dollars worth of bearish bets against Tesla. Why are they starting to see something in the horizon that is worrisome? We will see. But today we have another massive mega trade worth over $20 million against Tesla. And we will cover this one during the options segment. For now, we're moving on to cover the market's performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 131.02 points or a gain of 0.38%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 18.42 points or a gain of 0.13%. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 22.44 points or a gain of 0.52%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, energy, at number two for the silver, healthcare, and at number three for the bronze, utilities. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by technology, consumer defensives, and consumer cyclicals. We don't have a theme in the action today, of course, energy is inflationary, but utilities usually outperform under expectations of deflation, not inflation, and therefore the market is trading based on the algorithms, yo-yoing back and forth, back and forth between the inflationary and disinflationary themes. Looking under the hood for the advance to decline ratio across markets, starting with the NYSE, 70% advancing versus 28% declining. The NASDAQ. 56% advancing versus 41% declining. Moving on to futures. The action today was in crude oil futures, rising significantly higher, specifically the WTI, blasting higher by over 2% today. And now we have more calls that we're going to see crude oil prices trading above 80 by the end of the summer. What about softs? We have gains led by OJ, Lumber, Cotton and sugar futures, massive gains for OJ today. Meanwhile, coffee and coca futures lagging behind today. What about metals? Now, the expectations are that when the US dollar blasts higher, we see a lot of pain in metals. And this has been the picture since the taper tantrum. But now we're seeing metal prices stabilizing while the US dollar continues to rise higher. So are metals predicting a top in the US dollar? We will see. Because this is according to at least gold and silver holding ground today pretty much at the flat line while the US dollar was blasting higher but we have conflicting messages here because copper declined significantly today by the tune of over 1%. So which one is telling the truth regarding the US dollar? Is it gold, which is predicting an upcoming top in the move for the US dollar? Or is it copper, which is declining significantly today, predicting higher highs for the US dollar? We will see. What about meats? We have decent gains for feeder and live cattle futures. Meanwhile, lean hogs closing to the downside today with losses of about zero. 0.16%. What about grains? The gains in grains led by oats and soybean meal futures. Meanwhile, canola closing at the flat line along with corn, rough rice, soybean oil, soybean futures. Meanwhile, we saw the bulk of the losses coming from wheat futures declining by about 2% today. Moving on. To the big casino, the options market, what do we have here? The hottest table, per usual, number one, Apple, with about 1.1 million contracts. About 70% of those were calls. And we are seeing options traders becoming more bold in bidding in favor of Apple moving higher, making bullish bets, buying calls aggressively at least today. Which is, by the way, a sign that the opposite could happen because these are the Johnny-come-lately. Apple been rising higher and higher and higher quietly for weeks now. And now you got the Johnny-come-latelys following the trade after the real juice has been already extracted from the trade. And here we have another one in NEO. NEO has been rallying in stealth mode unnoticed due to elevated call options activities. And today we saw a massive dip of about 4% or so in NEO. And here comes the Johnny-come-latelys 
chasing the trade after the fact. They're buying the dip here because we saw elevated options volume for NEO, closing the day with about 960,000 contracts, about 70% of those were calls. And at number three, AMC remains a hot name in the options market, closing the day with about 830,000 contracts, about 58% of those were calls. Here's the problem with AMC. The bets to the downside, meaning puts, are accelerating. You're seeing the put-to-call ratio getting closer to 1 when it was suppressed for weeks and weeks and weeks. What does that say? Perhaps we're seeing capitulation here. Perhaps we're seeing the predator finally approaching the prey smelling blood. And when we talk about predators... We're talking about hedge funds and the likes who've been watching the action, waiting for signs of a top for the move, the squeeze that is, to start shorting AMC once again. Are they starting to short it now that they're smelling that the move is over? That certainly could be, but there is an important level for AMC to keep, and we will talk about this level in the technical analysis segment. What about the unusual activities taking place in the options market today? We have a lot of them, starting with the ticker HAL. This is for Halliburton, and they are making bullish bets for the name on the heels of the rise in energy stocks today. And of course, all these forecasts indicating that energy prices will reach 80 to 85 by the end of the summer. This is making energy stocks look sexy once again. Here's one of them, and they're buying the 28 calls expiration date September 17th with expectations that the name will rise by over 18% by then. They paid about 69 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $3 million. What about the trade for the ticker DISCA, Discovery? In the aftermath of the collapse of Arcagus Capital, Viacom and Discovery stocks haven't recovered yet. And they remain out of favor. Yet we saw Viacom moving higher, rising from the dead, from the ashes in the beginning of the week. And perhaps Discovery will follow through. At least this is what this trade is betting on. Because they're buying the 37 and a half calls expiration date August 20th. With expectations that the name will rise by over 20% by then. They paid about 60 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about two million dollars what about the trade for the ticker double a p l apple they are buying the 146 calls expiration date july 30th with expectations that the name will rise by over six and a half percent by then and they paid about a buck a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 1.3 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker a b n b this is for airbnb the name is moving higher and we're seeing elevated call options buying in this name in this case they're buying the 175 calls expiration date july 9th with expectations that the name will rise by over 14 percent by then and they paid about 60 cents a piece to enter this trade making the total entry cost for this trade to about $700,000. What about the trade for the ticker NIO, NEO? They're buying the dip here by buying the 56 calls expiration date July 9th, with expectations that the name should rise by over 10% by then, and they paid about $0.63 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $600,000. And notice that this, along with the Airbnb trade are short-term trades. They expire next week. So they're just buying the dip, betting on a rebound that these stocks will bounce higher again by the end of the week, meaning by tomorrow, and they'll close them right away. These are not high conviction trades. What about the trade or trades for the ticker SPY? Because this is a put spread. They are buying the 395 puts with the expiration date of August 2nd. Paying about a buck a piece for this trade, which brought the total all the way to about $1 million. On the other hand, they also sold the 385 puts with the same expiration 
expiration date of August 2nd. And for this trade, they managed to collect about 75 cents a piece for a total of about $750 thousand dollars which bring the total entry cost for the spread trade to about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars they paid a million they got 750 and all in all they paid about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and they are looking for the spy to drop by the tune of about ten percent but not more than ten percent and this trade will be extremely profitable creating triple digit gains. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker TSLA, Tesla, the souffle. Somebody's betting that the souffle will start melting soon. This is a big one because they're buying the 640 puts expiration date July 30th with expectations that the souffle should drop by more than 5% by then and they paid about 28 bucks a piece to enter this trade bringing the total to about 22 million dollars a massive number moving on to the heat map analysis clearly the inflationary trade is outperforming today whether we're talking about financials energy industrials and even materials and in this bipolar market when the inflationary trade outperforms that comes on the expense of the underperformance of disinflationary stocks the hard trade of technology growth momentum and high multiple stocks and we saw significant losses here for the chinese names high multiple names like neo spotify twilio baidu snapchat all of these names underperformed today along with uh, certain software names unity software down big today snowflake down big today and even the semiconductor chips names with a massive reversal to the downside. Meanwhile, the quote-unquote safe trade manages to outperform either way, whether we have an inflationary theme or a disinflationary theme. What are we talking about? We're talking about the big cap technology stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook. These have been on a steady climb higher for weeks now, and therefore they're dubbed as safety until the tapering argument is settled in the bond market. What about themes? Starting with the reopening trade outperforming for the most part and once again it is an inflationary day where inflation stocks along with the reopening stocks the value stocks tend to outperform here is the performance of the inflationary trade closing the day with modest gains we did not see excessive moves one way or the other this week we keep going back and forth back and forth rotating between the value trade and the growth trade the inflation trade and the disinflation trade but we're not seeing sizable moves one way or the other from any trade when it's in favor and that is typically an indicator of indecision confusion waiting for a catalyst to spark a final decision could that be the upcoming jobs report coming out tomorrow morning could be what about disinflation stocks underperforming today as expected specifically the high multiple and high growth names like octa peloton arc invest docusign square yet the non-high multiple disinflation stocks are still outperforming these stocks on the left hand side dollar tree american airlines duke energy dr horton these are the kind of companies that suffer in the late stages of inflation moving on to charts starting with the 30 minutes chart of the spy what's new another gap higher under extreme low volume the market continues to rise and grind its way up higher and higher and higher we are waiting for a reversal signal that will give us a resistance level to look for for now we don't have any resistance level we don't have any guideline to say this is the level you gotta watch for for the chart to face resistance we have to wait for the chart to show us the level via a reversal signal until then the assumption is the market continues to grind higher what about the continuous contract of the spy again we're seeing the momentum indicators strengthening higher and in the case of the spy we're seeing the negative divergence in volume correcting to the upside not to the downside so the question is is the market anticipating a rotation back to the inflation trade the value reopening commodities etc if that's about to come back in favor then the spy should continue to rise higher because the s p 500 doesn't care about the bipolar action in the stock market the spy is the globe 
containing both poles. If the inflation trade of financials, energy, industrials, and materials rise higher, that will be good enough for the SPY to continue to rise higher. And what if the disinflationary trade of technology start to rise higher and outperform the inflation trade? That doesn't matter for the SPY because technology is the biggest component of the SPY. And we will see the S&P 500 also rising higher. It is extremely hard to bet against the SPY, the S&P 500 meaning the market, when you have a bipolar market finding refuge in one pole when the other pole stops working. Until this piece of psychology, this mentality stops and market participants cease to find refuge in either poles, then the SPY, the S&P 500 goes down. The question is, what will spark such change in psychology in the market? What will be the catalyst? Moving on to a 30 minutes chart of the Qs, the Nasdaq. Similar story here, we have a chart that is grinding higher, gapping overnight on low volume. The difference between the Nasdaq and the SPY is that the Nasdaq is starting to show some signs of weakness and an upcoming reversal. For example, this is a daily chart of the Qs. We have a defined trend line that we keep going down to revisit to continue to trend higher. The assumption is that the chart has diverged too long away from the trend line, which is an indicator that there is a pullback to the trend line coming soon. The problem is you wouldn't know when that turn will happen. So we have to look for other signs. And for that, we move on to the daily chart of the futures contract for the NASDAQ. In this chart, we start to see the momentum indicators are getting too extended. They are entering the area from which a reversal is expected. The RSI is reading above 70. The MACD indicator is reading above 200. These are extremes. Some call them overbought territory. The problem is that charts can stay quote-unquote overbought for a long period of time. So that alone doesn't give us any clue of when the reversal will happen. What we have to look for is candlestick patterns. That will be a reverse hammer, a gap and crap, among other signals. Likewise, we're watching the volume divergence. The volume was trending to the downside, and that was good for the Qs, the Nasdaq, to rise higher. Low volumes are good for the market. But now the volume is starting to pick up higher, and it is picking up to the downside, not the upside. This is the opposite picture we're seeing with the SPY. The SPY, the volume is picking up higher to the upside, pushing the SPY higher. The volume in the NASDAQ is arriving to the downside, rising when the NASDAQ is trading lower. So this is the first clue of cracks within the NASDAQ. This move is getting too extended, too hot, and we should anticipate a reversal to the downside. Small caps, the IWM, 30 minutes chart. We talked about the double bottom formation and we talked about 229 becoming strong support for the IWM. And that enabled the chart to rise higher. And now we're getting closer to the next resistance level of 233. The assumption is we saw two big reactions from the support level of 229 indicating that 229 should be good enough to push the chart to the next resistance level. And in this case, it is 233. So if the chart reverses before doing that, failing before reaching 233, we indicate that 229 was not a good level of support and it should be retested and the likelihood is it will fail. So if you are bullish on the IWM, you don't want to see a reversal in this chart before reaching 233. If you are bearish on the IWM, you want to see a reversal before reaching 233, and then you're going to look for 229, which is likely to be broken to the downside at that point. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? We've been anticipating a move higher in the Dixie, and here it is. The US dollar is marching all the way to 93. The momentum indicators remain strong, the RSI, the MACD, are still steepening. Now the likelihood is we have a gap at 92.9. That should be a resistance level for the US dollar. And this is the difference, by the way, between charts like the US dollar and the NASDAQ. We know that both are overextended. We're looking for tops in both. But one chart is trading at all-time highs, and we cannot find a resistance level. We can smell the top, we can feel the top, we can anticipate the reversal, but we have to wait for the chart 
to show us the resistance level and the reversal signal. On the other hand, with a chart like the US dollar, or seeing an extended move, but not at all time highs, we have guidelines, we have references to base our forecast based upon. And in this case, we have a level to watch for, and that is 92.9. Switching to gold, what's going on here? We're seeing weakness, we have a bear flag formation, but gold is holding above the Fibonacci retracement level, which is an indicator that perhaps the bear flag formation will not play out to the downside, because the momentum indicators, the MACD and the RSI, are both bottoming, are both readying for a positive divergence. If if that is the case, then this retracement level will be excellent for a bottom in gold, and we will see gold bouncing higher once again. So the question is, is the action in gold the last few days an indicator for an upcoming reversal in the US dollar? Because typically, when the US dollar rises higher, with these big shots higher, we see gold and metals suffering. But the last few days, as the US dollar started to rise higher, breaking above 92, gold held ground. It didn't go down. And in my opinion, this is a message from gold that the US dollar is topping. What about the 10 year yield? This is the most critical chart to watch tomorrow because we are awaiting clarity from the bonds market. And when I say we, I mean stock market investors who've been at the mercy of the bond market, not making a decision one way or the other, whether yields should be trading above 1.5% or below 1.5%. And perhaps the upcoming non-farm payroll report coming out tomorrow, perhaps that will bring clarity to the bond market to make up its mind should the 10-year yield above 1.5% or below 1.5%. And when that is clear, then we will know exactly where the stock market is going. For example, here's the TLT. And if the 10-year yield closes the week below 1.5%, this will be a green light for the TLT to rise all the way to 149 or perhaps 150. Moving on to the VIX. And we are looking at a four hours chart. I highlighted for you the previous times when the MACD indicator turned bullish on the VIX. In each case, the VIX rose creating gains of over 20% minimum. So this time around, where we're seeing the MACD indicator turning bullish once again. The move so far created about 13%, which is down from the average of the last three pops. That could be the case because the MACD indicator turning negative again, at least from today's activities. Now we still have one day left, before we close the week, and the MACD indicator could be corrected, and we see the positive momentum in the VIX improving once again. The SPY is trading at all-time highs, and therefore we have to wait for the chart to show us the resistance level, but we use the VIX as a leading indicator to try to forecast the resistance. And in this case, the VIX is not predicting any resistance anytime soon for the SPY. If anything, it is a positive indicator for the bulls that the SPY has higher highs to go before facing a resistance. This is at least from the activities today looking at the MACD indicator for the VIX. You know that the SPY is about to reverse if you see the VIX popping higher and you look at the four hours chart and you see the MACD indicator turning green again and the momentum is strengthening. We're seeing higher bars on the histogram. These are all signs for the reversal. And a lot of traders hunt for those. What about Apple? What's going on here? We talked about the battle of the momentum indicator versus the candlestick pattern. The candlestick pattern was still positive and it remains positive. But we started to see the MACD indicator weakening from a 30 minutes perspective, and that produced a drop of about 1%. It wasn't good enough to go all the way down to the support level of 135, but it was good for about 1% correction. Now we're seeing the momentum is strengthening once again, and Apple is rising higher, and the next destination is 138. Now, for all of you technical analysts, the resistance level is technically at 137.20, but I'm being conservative here by placing the number a little higher at the level of 138. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle. Somebody's betting over $20 million against the stock, but the chart remains bullish. Folks, this is bullish consolidation. It's a bull flag. You had a pop higher. And now the chart's consolidating around 679, which is an important resistance level. But the assumption is, after spending some time with 679, the chart will have the permission to break higher. And these should be the expectations 
until we get a sign of a reversal. For now, we don't have any at all. What about tulips? Bitcoin, what's going on here? Apparently, the magic of Mama Kathy lasted for about one day because we don't have any retail follow-up from the pump from Mama Kathy. And now BTC is trading below my threshold of 35,750. The likelihood is that if the weakness continues, we will see a massive battle during the weekend. And this will be the 30,000 battle. And by the way, whether you're bull or bear on Bitcoin, you want to see this battle happening sooner than later. You want to have a definitive conclusion one way or the other. Is 30,000 a strong level of support or will it be broken to the downside? Because the battle of 30,000 will result in capitulation from either the bulls or the bears. If BTC goes down to 30,000 and bounces once again, then we will see bear capitulation the bears will say okay you know what we're not getting below 30,000 and the flush down is not gonna happen so let's start covering our shorts and you will see BTC rising higher significantly however if the bears win and they manage to break below 30,000 then we will see bull capitulation and the bulls will say you know what 30,000 did not hold there's gonna be a lot of pain to come here let's book whatever profits we have right now let's book whatever losses we have right now and you see a massive flush down and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy lastly what about amc what's going on here we talked about amc during the options coverage losing steam whether from options volume or notional volume matter of fact we're seeing an uptick in bearish activities in bearish bets buying puts the put to call ratio starting to rise higher but the good news for the apes is the level of 52 hasn't been broken yet this is the support. This is the strongest level to watch out for. 52. You don't want to go below 52 because there is a gap below 50, but there are no guarantees that 50 will hold if 52 fails. So the guardians at the gate for the apes better defend 52. Because as we talked with BTC, we're going to see capitulation here one way or the other from the apes or the bears right around 50, 52. I'm looking at 52. We can go max to 50. But that's about it. We will see capitulation around 50. And capitulation always result in massive moves, one way or the other, depending on whose side the capitulation is coming from. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? In case you haven't been paying attention, we have the big number out of the BLS, the non-farm payroll report. It is extremely important. And the cooks are going to be busy, busy, busy in the morning. But what are they cooking? If they cook the number too high, then now we're sparking the tapering discussion. If they cook the number too low, then now we're sparking the wage inflation slash stagflation discussion. So the cooks, once again, will attempt to park the number right around the middle. Not too hot, not too mild. We know that the Biden administration, at least for now, like their number medium. And this is how the cooks will attempt to cook the number. We're going to watch for the bonds market reaction first. And you will see the algos taking the lead from the bonds market and sparking a reaction right away in the equities market. And let the fun begin for the second half of the year. Folks, that's all I got for you for now. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.